What's up wild people? Welcome back to my channel if you're new. I'm Alexandria Denise and these are my wiggly little friends. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna let them eat now. They're hungry. So why even bother with this project? What can these faceless, slimy little creatures that shrivel up in the sun and ultimately become bird food possibly do for me? Well, I'm here to tell you a lot. You might not want to wiggle away from this video because I'm about to dig deep on the topic what's known as vermicomposting. I got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get digging. Everyone rave about cute humble bees, but no one is talking about the underdog or underground worker, worms. At some point in your gardening journey, you might ask yourself how you can maximize the health of your soil without constantly buying fertilizer and other products that claim to be a benefit. Luckily, Mother Nature has already provided a simple and reusable solution that can save your garden and your wallet. Worms are coined the ecological engineers when it comes to environmental health. They're tasked by nature with the job of replenishing vital nutrients, breaking down decomposed matter, as well as secrete cutaneous or skin mucus that is metabolized by microorganisms living in the soil. The mucus has multiple uses, but is nutrients rich, containing vital carbohydrates and proteins that also contributes to plants' health. Worms also add structure to the soil. Their tunnels promote aeration or oxygen water drainage, and room for roots to expand and grow deeper. In addition to the mucus, they excrete poop, called castings. And it's these castings that can be used to fertilize any plant without being harsh. Seriously, it's pretty hard to over-fertilize in worm castings, unlike chemicals. Plants will only take what they need daily. Anything extra will be used later. First things first, I have to build a worm bin. There are more complex designs out there, but I'm going to keep it simple. A plastic bin I bought for $6 and a power drill would do. Depending on the size of your bin, determine how big you want your drain holes to be and attach the appropriate bit. The smaller the holes, the many you want to have, and the larger the holes, the fewer. Drain holes are important because worms breathe through their skin in a process called cutaneous respiration, so the soil needs to stay moist. Holes too small causes poor drainage, leading to soggy soil, and holes too big allows excess drainage, causing the soil to dry too quickly, meaning your worms will either drown or dehydrate, and being in a container, moisture regulation is tricky. The right-sized holes can regulate the amount of moisture for the longevity of your worms. Repeat the process with a lid. This is essential to keep unwanted debris out while also providing adequate airflow. On a hot day, you can also pour water in without opening the bin and disturbing your worms. Next, measure out a screen for the bottom and for the lid of the bin. This will stop soil erosion and keep most unwanted pests out. It may even help detain the worms and keep them from escaping. I found this to be rare. So long as you keep your bin under the right conditions, this shouldn't happen, but the chance is never zero. Now add suitable enough soil you want your worms to replenish. Just make sure it doesn't contain any contaminants such as oil or decaying animal flesh. I'll tell you why later. Now for the worms. If you're new to my channel, you'll learn that I try to be as resourceful as possible. And like the soil in my loam soil video, if mother nature provides it for free, why waste money on it? So I do it the old fashioned way and attempt to attract the worms needed. Red wigglers, AKA red worms. Red worms dwell at surface level of at least about three inches if not right under fallen debris. They feed on decaying matter, but at a much faster pace, and they live in colonies. So where you find one, there are usually many. These are the species of earthworms needed for vermicomposting. Rainy days offer the perfect opportunity to scoop them up. Worms of all kinds come to the surface as the ground becomes saturated so they can better breathe 
and easily moved to new locations. Unfortunately, the majority of the worms I collected were night crawlers. They are what many commonly refer to as earthworms, but in truth, they are just one species of many and are the opposite of redworms. They are loners and live deeper below the surface in addition to being slow feeders. It's because of this that they are not quite ideal for composting at the capacity we need them for, but at least they make great fishing bait. I probably found about seven true red worms so far and it's definitely going to take more than that. I even laid out a board and put some kitchen scraps under it to attract them for the next couple of rainy days, but none showed. <sighs> Time for plan B. Got to spend some money. After failing to attract wild red worms, I ordered domestic ones from Amazon. Surprised? They came with a care guide on how to prepare the worms for their new home. I ordered 250 or one fourth of a pound to start so they were all at the bottom of the container. Basically, since they've been in snail mail for about two days and in the summer heat, I needed to immediately open the container and place them in a dark, cool room for a couple of hours. In the meantime, I whipped up a meal for both of us. My excellent <laughs> venison casserole is a quick, tasty breakfast grab made for the keto and low-carb life. Visit my second channel, True Nature's Kitchen, for more wild game and other naturalistic recipes. But this particular one requires 12 eggs, and I definitely found use for the shells. After extracting the yolk and the whites, I just pinched the eggs and peeled off the thin membrane inside of the shell, leaving a dry side. I don't discard the membrane, but incorporate it into the meal as an added source of collagen. I then grind the shells into small enough pieces to add them to the worm bin. It's not just for added calcium in the soil, but because worms don't have teeth. Oftentimes, they swallow small hard particles in the soil, such as sand, to aid in digestion. This isn't necessary, but it is helpful to your worms for them to devour food. The smaller you make it for their little mouths, the better. Though it's recommended to let them settle for two days before adding feed, I figured all that traveling made them hungry. I went ahead and added old biodegradable containers as bedding, dead roots from previously pulled plants, and a little kitchen scraps. This is optional depending on your situation, but the ants around here are vicious opportunists. They totally raged war on my last set of compost worms years back, and I want to be sure that doesn't happen again. So I'm just going to layer the ground around the bin with this ant killer I've had for some time and hoist the bin on top of some rocks for support. I did a fresh prune on my tomato plant, so plenty of fresh greens to go into the bin, as well as browns, which is ideal food for them. Greens restore nitrogen back into the soil, and browns carbon. I'm cracking the bin to help lower the temperature a bit more. Worms do well in temperatures between 55 and 75 degrees. It's been in the 80s. Even if the bin is in a shady area, I wait for the cool of the evening to place them in their new home. The bin is also pre-moist to encourage them to burrow. You can place more soil on top of them if you like. I'm going to let them feel their way around and naturally conform to the space. The next morning, I actually found most of them still on the surface and kind of congregating at the top here because of the morning dew. So they were in a pool of water. I reread the care guide and it did say the worms may need excess water after traveling due to dehydration. So even if the soil was moist, it wasn't enough. I placed a bowl of water inside for them to dip in when needed and after which it seems they settled in nicely. So now that the bin is built and the worms are in, let's recap and digest some things. Material and design. 
There is a common but not official way to craft a worm bin, but it is best to use material appropriate for your climate. Plastic is universal and wood is too, but at some point may need replacing. Metal is a good option too, but just be mindful that it conforms to temperatures. Living in warmer climates using a metal container isn't the best, but places where the summers are cooler should be fine. If doing a simple design like mine, remember that the size of the drain holes at the bottom and the air holes on the lid matters. Good airflow and moist soil are key. Shady spots in the hot months are always ideal, but shelter in the cold months is equally important. Temperature determines how productive your worms are. Anything colder than 50 degrees, their metabolism slows, and they stop feeding, causing them to go into a hibernation type state. It's the reason fishing worms are stored at the bottom of the fridge. Anything below 25 degrees, you risk them freezing to death, especially in a container. It's why this past winter, I had to bring mine inside the garage during below 30 degree days. Types of worms. As stated before, red worms are the way to go. Not to say you can't pair them with night crawlers, but that depends on how much real estate you have for them. They will mainly be at the bottom feeding on whatever is passed to them. Also, something I learned is that even if wild red worms and domestic ones do virtually the same thing, there are some differences. Wild wigglers don't reproduce nor feed at the rate that red worms bred for farming composting does. They aren't conditioned for life in a container, neither are they heat tolerant like domestic ones, so it's harder to keep them. They will become little escape artists no matter how well you care for them. Therefore, the best option is domestic ones. Over time, you may even see other types of critters accompany your worms, so don't be alarmed. Earwigs, springtails, millipedes, potworms, black soldier fly larvae, and mites, with the exception of one, are friends to your worms. The foes to freak out over are centipedes, fruit flies, ants, roaches, spiders, and earthworm mites, which are the ones to be concerned about. Lastly, food and care. Don't leave it all up to mother nature. They are in a container after all, and you regulate what they eat and how often they get water. There are two types of feed, slow feed, which is left whole, and fast feed, which I blend into small particles for them to consume quickly. Depending on how many worms you have will determine how much you feed them. It's said that a pound of worms can consume a half a pound of food a day, so for safety, keep that rule in mind. Overfeeding them can lead to a filthy bin and unwanted pests previously mentioned. If you have a lot of things to compost, consider increasing the size of your bin and the number of worms to suit your needs, or consider blending scraps, putting them in a bag and freezing them for future use. They can eat a variety of kitchen scraps and even biodegradable material like these plates I use for cover, but avoid putting in animal products. They can eat it, but an accumulation of this can again attract the unwanted pest that can consume it quicker than the worms. Definitely avoid tossing in members of the Aeolum family, such as onions and garlic, as well as citrus, like lemon and oranges. As for sweets, fruits is great, just give it to them as a fast feed and in moderation. This was why ants raided my last compost bin because I was putting in too much. Think of it as a treat only. Mine love watermelon, as it provides them with sugar and water. I also put in avocado peels, loose leaf tea, even coffee grounds. I feed them maybe once every two weeks, even longer, to give them time to deplete their food. Even if you don't feed them for a month, it's okay. They most likely would just eat their bedding. Water is important though. Depending on the weather and season, once to twice a week is recommended. In general, the majority of your feed should consist of greens and browns, which are nitrogen and carbon rich. Remember, it's not just about disposing your kitchen waste, but replenishing your soil to rotate out and use for future gardening.
Thank you for being just as down to earth as the worms and sticking out this video with me. Like water to plants, hitting the like button helps this channel grow and this video branch out to reach more people. If you want to see more valuable content like this, then subscribe to the tribe here and on other social media platforms in the description below. If your appetite is as big as my wiggly friends here, then track down tasty recipes on True Nature's Kitchen where I feature wild game, keto, paleo, low carb, and other delicious dishes. Until next time, dig your roots deep, grow beyond your haters reach, and stay wild.